Hello and welcome to our Wednesday webinar series. We appreciate that you're joining us at Grand Canyon University's Canyon Professional Development. And folks, you have a treat in front of you. Today, we're going to be talking about citizen science. That's you, that's me, that's everyone around us that can get out there and make a difference in the scientific community with our very special guest, Cal Manis, who is what I call the rural STEM guru of Arizona. If you are teaching in rural schools in Arizona, I know that you know Cal Manis. He has a wealth of information and knowledge to share with us today. I, I always ask our guests to pick a quote that resonates with them. Can you describe what it is that you chose and why? Yeah, so I'm a real huge advocate of science literacy and, and STEM literacy as well. I think it's highly important that our citizenry be informed of how to differentiate between fact and misinformation and the protocols observations that science allows make that possible so i like this quote from neil degrasse tyson brilliant and i love neil degrasse tyson he just brings physics into a realm of understanding so tell me, Cal, what really is citizen science? So it's, re it's really interesting. This is a process that seems very new and is, in fact, extremely old, but it's the collaboration between research scientists and community members, especially those who are curious, you know, those who are insatiably curious, the the folks who have never squashed their inner three-year-old that asks why everything works. This is what keeps those folks busy. That's a great definition. So concerned, motivated, and engaged to make a difference. And I think right. that's exactly what we need more of. What is the historical realm of, of citizen science? Well, if you really think about it, science as a profession is relatively new. Only since probably the mid 1800s with the Age of Enlightenment do we have professional scientists. Prior to that, it, all citizens could be scientists. And while it was often the realm of folks who are at universities or were wealthy, everybody was collecting data. Well, just like they do now, whether you're a, um, a rancher or a farmer, or a hairdresser or a cook. We all collect data to make decisions. Oh, and wow. so this is what the realization is that we're all scientists. If we ask the question why, then we're a scientist. Tell me more, tell us where we're going today. So really these four cornerstones is a lot of this information comes from research that's been done with community science projects over the last decade, really, it's community level science, so everybody can be involved. So scientists need data collected a certain way so that they can use it. And over the last few years, probably the last five years, this is becoming, becoming easier and easier, and we'll see it in a few minutes, because of different platforms where the data can go into, that's the input, and then the scientists and community can take it out as well when wow. it's been aggregated that protocol provides very high quality data and it can be used by both the professional and non-professional very reliably and it also there's such a wide variety of choices like anybody's interest everybody's why can be found out there from frogs to flowers and from <laughs> You know, from otters to sharks, anything that you're interested in, even auroras this is a really cool aurora project right now, um, is out there. So this is fantastic. So these cornerstones allow us to um, to be a part of authentic data and valid data that real professional scientists can use. Talk to us about the impacts of citizen science. Yeah, so I mean, if you really think about it, it kind of falls into three major groupings okay. one of the the biggest issues is the the terabytes of information that that are being developed minute by minute so <laughs> we have space-based satellites hundreds of them we have ground-based satellites we have 
folks doing research in the oceans and in the soils and the mountains and the earthquakes. There's so much information that really the only way to deal with it is to crowdsource it. And so the other piece is that this bridges all of these gaps around curiosity, but also um, diversity and inclusion. There, there are no barriers to data. And if anybody wants to help, they can. And so that's a big piece. The other is it actually enables the professional scientists to push the frontiers of their science. Wow. So they can move faster with help. Like many, many hands make light work. This is, this is the concept. And then yeah. it goes back to the original quote from Neil deGrasse Tyson about policy. When you are a part of the research and you are a part of um, making, gathering data and trying to understand it, you're informed. Yeah. And your part and, and the perspective, you just said multiple perspectives can share. So right. we need those multiple perspectives to create a just society in this in this realm. Fascinating. So the scope uh, enables me to be able to utilize data that that matters. Is is that what you would say? I would say so. You know, and, and data is an interesting animal <laughs> because it it shows up in a lot of different ways, which is actually even more interesting. You you will see it as we go through some of the the data sites. Some are places where you can visualize. Some are really uh, picture based. There's there's just a wide variety for what is comfortable for different people. I mean, different people have different comfort levels. And so data can come in, in different ways. Well, and I love that whenever we work with data. So to think about the larger why, the impact, bridging the gap, the scope of where we're, where these investigations can take us, and obviously the policy, as you said before, that Neil deGrasse Tyson talked about. Let's take a look at some of these sites because you have a lot of opportunity for us to learn. Let's start with SciStarter. So SciStarter is one of the, probably one of the larger citizen science aggregators. Different organizations will create a page on SciStarter and you can search for them. All over the country, different interests. You'll notice the fields in the upper right-hand corner, find a project if you'd like, or you can just randomly do it. Also, you can do this by on your cell phone. And if you do that, then you can turn on your um, GPS and it will look for uh, projects in the area, in your area. You can turn the GPS off and then just go by topic. So it's really interesting. Honestly, there's stuff, all kinds of things, astronomy, aquatics, um, bats and bugs and whatever it and is. And here's a couple of featured product uh, projects. So if you're not sure where to go, you can go right to their featured area. This has a lot of training. Okay. Pieces. So if you wanted to, if you wanted background on how to set up your own project or what these projects really look like and, and some more in-depth history or some research articles. So there have been quite a few research articles. You can go through the training section of this. This is all free. And it's it's quite extensive. You can badge, you get badges. It's kind of cool. The folks who designed these kits are specialists in informal kit building. They're mainly from children's museums. It's Wonderful. Cool. So you're yeah. getting high quality. It's well, very high quality and well researched. But I really like this concept of library uh, kits and being able to be anyone. So a parent, a homeschool, micro school. Uh, this uh, size starter is a great place to start. Fieldscope is another aggregator. The difference with Fieldscope is, is these sites visualize their data. And so each one of these will look different. The data will be different because the projects are looking at different things. If we look at Budverse, which is one of the oldest citizen science projects in the United States, yeah, it's now being hosted by the Chicago Botanical Gardens. Oh, cool. Yeah, this one shows you how many observations have been done. Budverse actually looks at when is the first greening 
of plants happening. And what the scientists are looking for is, is, is that changing, right? So this is one of the ways that field scope helps you to visual, see the data. It's on a map. And so I'm gonna click so, explore the data and there's the map. Right, you can explore the data in here. You can actually look at the data sets because most of the data sets are available if you're if you're that nerdy that you want to see data tables. I, <laughs> I might I might have been busted looking at lots of data before. Yes. Yeah, it happens. We some of us fall into that, but um, Ooh, this look, is one it way. In a table. Oh, okay. Yeah. Sorry. Yep. It's I'm getting, table. Getting so almost all here. of the the field scope, actually all the field scope projects will have data tables but how they visualize them will be different. Some will be graphs, some okay. will be infographics, some will be um, ArcGIS maps of different kinds. This really just depends on the project. That is something that kids, if they have their own data in this table, how much more excited will they be to, to map it like this? Just so that folks know, if you're a formal or informal educator, there's a mapping, there's professional mapping software that you can use called oh, ArcGIS. You can go to ArcGIS, you can get a, an educator's license, and you can build data onto these great maps. Oh my gosh, so excited. Okay, so we'll move along. And folks, everything will be in the show notes. Tell me about iNaturalist. This one I've used before. I absolutely love it. I've only used it on my phone, not my computer. So tell me a little bit about both. iNaturalist started off as a photo warehouse for photojournalists who wanted to collect pictures of um, work that they were doing and then be able to compare it. Wow. It has evolved from the original development and now is used worldwide, has one of the largest collections of both biome pictures and pictures of plants and animals, both on the land, in the air, on the sea, anywhere the community helps to identify the species. This is such a fun thing to do uh, just with my own children, like on a field trip when I'm, you know, at a hotel or something and we're like, let's go see what's out, out there. And to think that I'm also a part of the data collection is pretty cool. And you can set up your own citizen science observations. Like we've done this in the White Mountains where we do a bio blitz, set up uh, three or four hours and you collect everything that's living within a certain area and it goes onto your fold into your folder and you, so you can make your own folders yeah. so you so if you're a, a classroom or a classroom teacher you can do that and make your own folder within iNaturalist and have your kids put their data into that folder and so simply put i love how they say you record you share and you discuss. So truly, right. those are those attributes of a of a true scientist. Really trying to think about, okay, what is happening in around in and around me, and why. So absolutely hit, hits all, all those science standards, particularly the cross cutting concepts. It seems like such a great way to utilize that type of lesson in in your classroom and science classroom. Next, we have exoplanet exploration. Tell us about this one. So this is one of NASA's um, portfolio of about 36 different citizen science projects. Wow. And Exoplanet is where data from NASA is shared. And huh. there's, a, there's a tutorial on how to analyze the data. And what you're looking for is you're trying to find planets around other suns and other stars <laughs> that are within the visual scope of our multitude of different telescopes. So just so that you know, there are people around the world who have been doing this for a while and have discovered hundreds and hundreds of planets. The exoplanets that are discovered are not just from the scientists at NASA, but from like high school students in Virginia and accountants in Argentina. Um, Amazing. Yeah, and like the taxi driver in Germany. So this is the 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 one to go to when you're thinking about planetary science. This is part of the NASA Citizen Science portfolio. And so if you go to science.nasa.gov/slash citizen science, 
you will find the entire um, set. And so you just look to see what's interesting. Many of those can be done at your computer. Some can be done outside. If you're in northern parts of the country, there's an, a really cool Aurora project going on right now. And how yeah. neat is it that you can be a part of NASA? So really in, inspiring some of your students who want to be uh, astronauts. Hey, get them already working for NASA right now. That's pretty. Or even cool. those who don't even know that they want to be involved. With yes. <laughs> this is a really interesting citizen science over the last decade has really become a thing. The General Accounting Office at with the federal government has aggregated citizen science projects that show have shown up or are showing up in, in the process of showing up within the federal government. And there's a community, they've got a catalog of federal government projects. The nice thing is this toolkit. So it provides really um, an interesting, handy amount of information on development. So you want to set something up and you feel the need to get you know that that background you're not one of the folks that are like jumping off the cliff and figuring out how to land but you want to have your parachute ready uh this is a good place for it so that you can have a good background and so you can actually start your own citizen science project using the citizenscience.gov toolkit right so between citizenscience.gov information and site starters training information you should have enough material to to set up a high quality citizen science project for yourself or to be able to tell whether a project meets a quality level that you want to be involved in so okay next up is globe observer so globe observer is my i have to say it's one of my favorite citizen science projects oh bookmark this one folks okay well, probably because the Three or four months before this went online, I met with the developer in Boulder, oh. and cool. she was so engaging and she was so enthusiastic about this. I'm like, okay, I can't wait to see what it looks like. Uh -huh. And they did a phenomenal job. This can be downloaded off any app store. You set up a free account and you collect data using pre designed protocols, observational protocols. The, the app takes you step by step by step by step. You don't have to worry about um, if did I miss something? Did I not understand something? It takes you through it all. This app has been collecting data. This is from the last seven days all over the planet. And so there are four protocols that are currently being, uh, that are accessible. So one is clouds, one is land cover. So how is land being used? You need about a, a hundred feet in all directions. That's not, it doesn't have to be open because it could be houses and buildings, but how it's uh -huh. used. There's a uh, mosquitoes habitat and then tree heights. Huh. So when, when those high school students say, why do I have to learn how tall that flagpole is? Well, this is the same trigonometry except you don't have to figure it out with your calculator. It's all actually in the app. You just have to put the numbers in it figures it out for you. Very hey, cool. but it matters. So, <laughs> yes. Right. What are, so are these are measurements happening in these parts of the country and the world? Yes, actually. Yep. You know, the Along the x-axis at the bottom are the dates that the data was huh. collected from. Wow. So one of the things that's happening is NASA looks down from 250 miles or higher. It's called remote sensing. Mm -hmm. And a pixel can be anywhere between 30 meters square and 100 meters square, which means that there's no detail in that pixel. So what NASA is hoping is that we as the citizen scientists can help fill in that data so that the maps become much more robust. Wow. Okay. So they are depending on citizens to really uh, increase information in the areas of mosquito habitats i find that fascinating and that was my that was my question too like why why nasa mosquitoes like like paint this picture for me yeah um, i'm interested it's an interesting picture because mosquitoes that are disease vectors disease carrying mosquitoes are mostly tropical 
And what NASA is curious about is, are they changing the environment? Are, there, are they moving into other environments that are not their natural environments? Okay, I wanna and, make sure they're not moving into my environment as much. Right, so you know, we, we, there was that Zika scare in Florida a few years ago, it's still around. Um, but now they're finding these insects in places that are definitely not tropical. And the question is, why? Data is being gathered. That's one piece of it. The other piece is just to make people aware that the habitats that mosquitoes use for breeding, they don't, it, it's just puddles of water in these sort of things that are outside, wherever water accumulates and doesn't evaporate there are mosquitoes and, and many mosquitoes do carry diseases. So you wanna make sure that your area is clear of little bits of water. Okay, moving along. And again, folks, we're gonna have all of this in our show notes for you. Tell us about the national phenology. Phenology is the study of seasonal change and how those seasonal changes impact life forms, both, the, both plants and animals. But Really, they're focusing on educators, classroom and informal educators on as the main data collectors around the country. Wow, that's so awesome. You'll find this this group, they have a, a team of two or three folks that are education, they're in their education department. They will train you on how to create a phonology program that's local to your school or your library or your park system they will help you become certified phonology experts wow they have a huge amount of information that can be used my cohort when i took the certification group we had somebody from the smoky mountain national park we had somebody from the university of minnesota we had somebody from the everglades national park just a really wide variety of people, a couple of teachers, which is what I was at the time. Um, and everybody was using this site to create their own programs around Wonderful. nature. Wow. Great, just... great site and really, really helpful people. The folks that run this are amazingly helpful. Really great site for educators. Thank you for sharing that one. This is Zooniverse. Zooniverse was a aggregator site that astronomy programs basically were attracted to. The vast majority of citizen science projects on this site are astronomy based. So you'll notice how the aggregated numbers down here the number of volunteers, classifications, um, completed subjects. A lot of these are short-term um, crowdsourced data sets, right? To help understand something. Where's there a planet? Is there an asteroid moving through? A big thing on dark energy. So it, for, it's for those folks that are really fascinated uh, with astronomy. To tell you the truth, space science right now is in a, a renaissance and there is some amazing, breathtaking data that's coming in from a wide variety of satellites, but the James Webb especially, which is just starting to bring stuff in, in the from the infrared. I have one more. This is a one that you really like. It's called Esri. So and it's this got a is, really cool Arizona component component to it. Go ahead and tell me more about yeah, it. Yeah, so Esri is actually a, a, a fairly well-established corporation that produces corporate tools for infographics, mainly mm -hmm. around mapping, different different levels of mapping. Incredibly powerful tool. It's an analytical tool. As, as well. And you saw that when we looked at the field scope, when you saw the map of the of bud burst on field scope right here. So this is an Esri map. This is an ArcGIS map. You'll also okay. notice it if you look at a number of um, almost every state that has data set up in um, 
of visualization uh -huh. is using this tool. The cool Please. thing is that there is a free educator license. So Ooh. instead of spending tens of thousands of dollars on your license, you're not spending anything. And if you're a formal or informal educator, you can get an ArcGIS license and That's use it phenomenal. in your classroom. You can gather data and then visualize it. Boy, I'll tell you what I wondered about the uh, the impact of of uh, at the NPN site about mosquitoes. Like why are, we're looking at cloud cover, tree height, and mosquitoes, and the concept of having mosquitoes bringing some sort of dengue fever to an area that's not tropical. I wonder, and I'm fascinated by such. And so I guess uh, what I have to do is just get my citizen science vibe on and go out and find some of the answers to my problems alongside of my fellow citizens. Folks, these references are going to be in the show notes. So just know that everything we looked at today, you will see in our show notes. I really appreciate, Cal, you bringing all of these resources. I definitely have more than one thing that I took away. Really, the, the, the takeaway here, I know for me, has always been, I'm a, insatiably curious. And so if you're curious also, if you ask why and how, or you let yourself have the joy of asking why or how, you are now a citizen scientist. What a wonderful way to keep the curiosity and wonder alive. Thank you so much, folks. Please subscribe for more free PD. Can't wait to see you again, Cal. For now, we must say goodbye. Take care, everybody.